Hi folks, my name is Frank Wagner and I'm one of the pastors here at Holy Spirit Lutheran Church and I want to welcome you to worship at Holy Spirit. Now, there's something incredible going on right now. This is the 21st week of holding virtual worship services. Can you imagine it's been 21 weeks of doing worship in this manner? It's become normal for us. But you know what's not normal? is that on this Sunday, I'm actually going to be in two places at the same time. I'm going to be leading worship over in the sanctuary for our virtual congregation, but I'm also going to be here in this location underneath these beautiful trees here, out on our south field and in, in the south parking lot, and we're going to have our first drive-in worship service. First time in 35 years, we're going to have a drive-in worship service right out here on the field at 9.30 this morning. So new stuff coming up all the time. We wanted to try something new and different. Uh, we knew that people were looking forward to being able to be around each other. So in a safe way, we're trying drive-in worship. So whether you're at drive-in worship or in virtual worship, you're going to have a great service today. Let me also tell you what's happening this morning. Over in our north parking lot, closest to the ball field, in front of the sanctuary, we're going to have our drive-in communion as you are used to doing it, but we've just changed the location from the south parking lot over to in front of the sanctuary. So when you drive in on the property, just make a right-hand turn and the volunteers will direct you over there. Drive-in communion from 10 a.m. until 1 p.m. And then right over here in our east parking lot, you're gonna see the blood mobile. And we sure hope that you're able to, to make a donation because with COVID and all of the other uh, regular types of um, emergency needs, there's a big need for blood here in Palm Beach County. This past week, we sent to everyone that we have an email address for, as well as we put it onto our website, a very important survey that was created for you by me and the rest of our staff. And this is why this survey is so important. We are wanting to measure and to be informed about the needs in our congregation. We want to know what you're thinking and what needs you have, because we don't think that this COVID situation is going to go away very soon. And because we care about you and we want to be the church for you, we want to know what you're thinking, what your needs are, and how we can best serve you. So if it would be very helpful if you would Go to the website if, you don't, if we don't have your email address, or go to your email, find the survey, and fill it out. It, I did it myself. It only takes about three minutes to do it. It's very easy. Do it for each adult in your family, and if you want programs for your kids, fill one out for your kids as well. And have that survey into the church by this coming Wednesday, the 19th. I also want you to know that we are developing a brand new program, which we think will be very helpful to a lot of families in our community. As many of you know, school will be starting very soon here in Palm Beach County in the public school system. And as of now, they are planning for school to be virtual. In other words, kids will be staying home. But that's a big burden on a lot of families because many families have a single parent or two parents and they both have to work. So who's going to be helping the kids through virtual school? Or many parents don't feel that they are competent to be able to help their children with virtual school. So because we know that that's a need, our His Kids ministry, led by Diana Cosgrave, is going to be starting a program here at the church in the Learning Center for children who are going to virtual school, children in kindergarten through fifth grade, if parents would like for them to be here with us, we will have a certified teacher overseeing a program for those kids to be able to plug into their virtual school, but also to be able to get support and assistance and oversight in a safe environment from us. So if that's something that you're interested in, please contact Diana Cosgrave directly or contact the church office and we'll be glad to assist you with that. And then I would encourage you to go to our website. The website now has so many opportunities for you. We know that many of you are looking for things to do, things to learn, and we want to help you with that. So if you go to our website, we have exercise classes for you, Pilates and yoga. We have learning classes for you where there's all kinds of Bible studies being offered that you can participate in. 
we also have Coffee with the Pastor. That's going to be offered tomorrow, August Monday, August 17th at 10.30 a.m. If those are things that you're interested in, go to the website and we can help you to be able to participate. Because in the end, that's what's critical. Participating and learning more about the love of our Father and being in a relationship with Him. And then lastly, I want to remind you, Pastor Matthew and Sean Shapton, they are about to step into their new life in ministry over on the west coast of Florida at Babcock Ranch. And so we're in the process of doing some fundraising for them. We want to help them with their ministry expenses and we want to help them with their moving expenses. And we sent a letter to all of you that we have um, an address for. And so if you're intending to respond to those fundraisers, please do so soon so that we will be able to support them in ministry as soon as possible. Thank you. God bless you all. Enjoy worship. Now, let's go to worship together. I invite you to join with me in the brief order of confession and absolution. The Holy Spirit calls us together as the people of God. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us, even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Just over 90 backpacks were filled by his kids' families for the Lake 
Park Backpack Drive. Thank you to everyone who donated school supplies. And thank you to Diana Cosgrave and the His Kids families who packed each backpack while practicing physical distancing. Our Holy Spirit Lutheran Church has once again contributed necessary items to those in need, in this case, school-aged children. Whether they go back to the school building or learn virtually, they still need paper and pencils. What a blessing it is to give, especially in these challenging times. Thank you for your generosity and love. I love watching that video that Eric and Kara put together for us today because it says something very important about you and this church. What I noticed, what stood out for me was to see those young children and their parents gathering together here to learn about the fact that there are children in this world who are also getting ready to go back to school, but they don't have the resources to be able to have the backpacks and the supplies to get off to a good start in their new school year. Our kids are learning that. But they're not only just learning that it exists, but they are also learning through our church and through their families that there's something that we could and something that we should do about it. And I think those are very important lessons. Now normally, when we don't have COVID around, we take all of those backpacks that the children have made, we bring them up here to the altar, and we say a blessing over those backpacks and the children who will be wearing them so that they get off with a blessed school year. So I'm gonna take a moment now to ask a blessing over those backpacks and children, and then we'll continue. So please join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I am very grateful for our young children and our young families in the His Kids ministry that made it possible for these backpacks to be created, to be given as gifts to children that we don't even uh, really know personally. But these children that will be wearing these backpacks, they are precious to you. And they also value a good education and a, a good school year. And so, Father, we are asking now for your blessing upon these children, their families, their teachers, and these backpacks of supplies, that all of it will come together and be a blessing upon these children so that they too will grow and flourish. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What I also want to say to you is how much I appreciate you as individuals and you as the congregation of Holy Spirit Lutheran Church. And let me explain why. Because when I was outside observing this making of the backpacks, it, I, it, I realized it all came together. You as a congregation provided the financial resources or provided all of these school supplies and backpacks. You did that with your donations. But then you also provided a staff person Diana Cosgrave, who is the director of our His Kids ministry. And she was the one who put this idea together, contacted the families, got everything ready outside so that it could be safe, and the kids would be able to come to this campus and have this experience. Your donations did that. And then as well, your donations provided this beautiful location where the children and their families would be able to gather and they could take all of those good feelings that they have and associate them as their church, which provides a safe place where others can come together and do good things in the name of Jesus Christ for others. Your donations provide all of that. And I just want you to know as your pastor, I notice those things and I value your generosity, but far more important than me, God notices and he values your generosity. And he knows that you understand that you have been blessed in order to be a blessing to others. So as you are able, I would invite you to be generous in your giving to the ministries of Holy Spirit Lutheran Church. God bless you.
chapter 5 verses 16 through 25 so I say let the Holy Spirit guide your lives then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves the sinful nature wants to do evil which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants and the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires the two forces are constantly fighting each other so you are not free to carry out your good intentions but when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. This ends the reading. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Please join with me. Father, you know that I love your church. That the church has been a huge part of my life as long as I can remember. But there's a lot of emotion tied into that. There's 
there's a deep connection that I have that means that I, in so many ways, take my relationship with the church and with you for granted. It just feels right. But there are many people who don't feel that way, who don't understand the value of your church. They don't understand how important it is to the world and to people. So I pray, Father, that you will use today's message to help all of your listeners, all of your viewers, to gain a new appreciation and understanding of how important the church is to the world. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The question that I want to ask today and answer is this. Does the church really matter today? Is the message of the church relevant today? If the church were to disappear today, would it make a difference? The answer is absolutely yes. But the problem for us as Americans is that this is very difficult for us to appreciate. Your thinking and your understanding of right and wrong has been so impacted by Christianity, but it's impossible for us to appreciate it because we're unaware we just don't see it. We were born into a culture where certain values were taught and accepted. And we have come to believe that everybody thinks this way. And because we are so accustomed to this, we cannot appreciate the value and the impact that the local church of Jesus Christ has made on our culture. If we were ever able to stand back and get the right perspective, we would say, wow, the church really does matter. Perhaps the best way for us to appreciate the impact of Christianity and the church is to look at it from someone else's perspective. You may be familiar with the name David Aikman. He was the bureau chief in Beijing, China for Time Magazine for many years. He was a brilliant, highly regarded journalist and author. While Aikman was in Beijing, he had access to all kinds of Chinese leaders from government, business, science, and academia. And he did many interviews with them. I want to read to you a statement that someone he interviewed made about the impact that Christianity made on American culture. Because we're Americans, we can't see it as clearly and as easily as an outsider does. Here is a quote from this Chinese social scientist who had carefully studied the West. This is what this one individual said. One of the things we were asked to look into was what accounted for the success, in fact, the preeminence of the West over the rest of the world. China wanted to become a world player in the global economy, and so they asked these social scientists to find out what made the West so successful. He goes on to say, we studied everything we could from the historical, the political, the economical, and cultural perspectives. At first, we thought it was because you had more powerful guns than we had. The bigger your guns, the more powerful your economy, the more widespread your influence. That would make sense to us. Then we thought it was because you had the best political system. And next, we focused on your economic system. But now listen to this. He says, but in the last 20 years, we have realized that the heart of the Western culture is your religion, Christianity. That is why the West has become so powerful. These smart people in China are saying, the secret sauce for the West's success is Christianity. These smart people in China are saying, you people in the West may not realize this, but we have studied this carefully and have discovered that the secret to the success in the West is not your bombs, and it's not your economy, and it's not your democratic form of government. It is something else. It's your religion. It's your Christianity. That's what makes you powerful. The Christian moral foundation of social and cultural life is what made possible the emergence of the capitalistic system and the democratic politics. 
We don't have any doubt about this, they write. And this is what they discovered. It wasn't just capitalism, it was capitalism with a conscience that was informed by the teachings of the church. They stood back and realized that capitalism alone won't get us there, bigger bombs won't get us there, the secret sauce are these Christian values and the fundamental beliefs that brings them together. This amazing sense of right and wrong that informs human rights and individual rights. Do you know what the Chinese discovered that we have lost sight of? The church matters. The church makes a cultural difference. The things that we love and the opportunities that we have as Americans we want to credit it to a whole bunch of different things. But those who are on the outside who have studied this have said that the secret sauce in America is that there is a belief system and a value system and a dignity given to men and women and children, and it comes from our Christian heritage. That is the secret of Western success. We just can't see it. And the reason we can't see it is because we think, all of this just comes natural. We think that our view of right and wrong just comes naturally. Doesn't everybody treat people the way that we treat people? And the answer is no. That's why when we watch the news and we see the kind of suffering that goes on in the world because of the way that some people treat other people, and we ask ourselves, what's wrong with those people? How could they do that to each other? We would never allow that to happen in America. Why don't they do this or why don't they do that? And the answer is because they don't see the world the way that we see it in the West. We have been so extraordinarily impacted by Christianity through the church. Does the church matter? You bet it matters. We are not only stewards of the message of eternal life, we are also stewards of a message of a better kind of life. You see, nature in and of itself is violent. What comes naturally isn't good. Nature is an earthquake that destroys a country. Nature is a Category 5 hurricane that rips the Bahamas to shreds. Nature is a tornado leveling a neighborhood. Nature is a disease. Nature is an abundance of rain that floods a river that washes away homes and lives. Nature at times is beautiful. But when you look beyond the beauty, you see lots of violence. Nature is might makes right. Nature is all about first come, first serve. Now listen very carefully. This may be hard for you to accept. Human nature is no different. We think human nature is different because we're Americans. We think it's different because we have been so Christianized. But here is the truth. Human nature is racism. You're different than me, and I'm better than you. Human nature is injustice. You don't deserve it. That's human nature. You've seen it and felt it. Adultery is so prevalent. Well, why is that? Because it's natural. Cheating, lying, slavery, revenge, jealousy. That's all natural to human beings. The church matters more than we can imagine because the teachings of the New Testament through the church says that there is a superior way of living that values the dignity and the worth of every human being. Now, the Apostle Paul, the guy who spread Christianity throughout the Mediterranean Rim, he talks about this specifically. And I'm going to read some verses for you from Galatians chapter 5. In these verses, the Apostle Paul is going to contrast for us what nature looks like in people when they are left to their own. And then he's going to say, but what if there was a group of people that allowed God to control their behavior? What if there was a group of people that gathered together and allowed the Spirit of God to change the way that they viewed and treated other people? What would that be like? And then Paul is going to say, Church, this is what you're supposed to look like. And if you'll study history, 
you'll see that these little churches, these little groups of people who gathered around the teachings of the Apostle Paul and Jesus, the teachings began to change them. And then they began to change the culture of their community. So now listen to what the Apostle Paul writes. I'm reading from Galatians chapter 5. Paul writes, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. See, there's that word, nature. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. In other words, if you go natural, it's not going to be pretty. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces, nature and spirit, are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. My friends, this is what natural looks like. And none of it is shocking to us. It's all around us. And it's in you and in me. Does the message of the church matter? Absolutely. Because apart from the message of the church, If things went the way that nature wants to go, it would be a world that none of us wants. So Paul says, there is another way to live. There is another way to be. And this is how it starts. Here's what Paul writes. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. And let me just stop for a moment. This is so important. Do you know what the Holy Spirit is? The Holy Spirit is the thing that energized the first century apostles and the first century followers of Jesus to go out into the streets and to risk their lives and to say that God has done something new in our midst. The Holy Spirit is what inhabits a believer when they say that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He died for my sins and rose from the dead. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit moves into a person and begins to inform your conscience. It's the Holy Spirit that makes you think, oh, I shouldn't do that. It's the Spirit says, I don't think I should go. I don't think I should look. I don't think I should click on that. I don't think I should type. I don't think I should cheat. It's the Spirit that informs our conscience and gets us to live, to move, and to act in ways that on our own, naturally, we would never do. It is the Spirit that moves you to live a life that even if there weren't any laws, you would do the right thing. Now listen to this list that Paul gives us. He writes, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Does the message of the church matter? Oh, yes, because we are not just stewards of the message of eternal life. We are also stewards of the message that there is a better life, and it runs contrary to what is natural and normal, and no one else but the church is teaching this message to the world. Amen. Please join with me as together we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I want to remind you that today we will be having Holy Communion um, in the north parking lot. Uh, it'll be drive-in Holy Communion, and all of you are invited to participate from 10 a.m. until 1 p.m. Just come here onto the church campus, uh, make a right turn into the north parking lot, come forward to the sanctuary entrance, and Pastor Matthew will be there to serve you Holy Communion. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to receive communion. Please join with me in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your church. It's not a building. It's people. People inspired and emboldened by the Holy Spirit to share the life-transforming message of Jesus crucified for our sins and risen to give us new life in him. All the people of the world need your church. Like 2,000 years ago and throughout world history, sin is everywhere today, inside of me and throughout the world. We need your forgiveness. We need your peace. We need to know that there is a better life in you. You are our hope and confidence. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he gave thanks. He then broke it and gave it to his disciples and said to them, Take and eat, for this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then again, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks. He then gave it to his disciples and said to them, Drink of it, all of you, for this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. I invite you to join with me as together we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The table of the Lord is ready. I invite you to come and receive God's grace. Amen. Receive now the benediction. May the God of all grace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen.
in peace. Serve the Lord.